it's 530. Years. This is really a kind of a, a little damp spirit. It's obviously came out of some kind of uh, music hall situation in days gone by. Uh, perhaps it's a long time since you sang it, so somebody play a few bars. Are you going to play for us to stay Thou art a mighty saviour, 298. Blessed Lamb of Calvary, thou hast done great things for me. Thou didst leave thy throne above. Thou didst suffer out of love. I create. You don't know this, do you, Tristesse? How about this? <laughs> sensitive so we don't notice him, feel him, hear him. So we pause for just a moment to connect as it were once again. Father it's quite outrageous to us that you're looking for worshippers like us to worship you. On that account we wish to worship you in spirit and in truth, in sincerity, in genuineness, in nothing fake or false. So we bow in front of you and we ask that with the sensitivity that you've blessed us we shall feel your nearness right now. Mm -hmm. And in these moments that we shall spend together, may we hear your voice speaking to us just in the way we need to be spoken to right now. I have a pretty clear idea what you might want to say to me, but there is others around me have other subjects that you might want to raise to them. Help us not to miss this opportunity of receiving, but also of giving our praise and adoration to you. May it be an enriching moment, not because we're clever, but because you're kind. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Now, I've, uh, I thought we ought to have something beside my funny voice, which is a bit peculiar at the moment. And I've asked uh, Chris to sing for us and Fred to play a hymn tune for us. Fred, I think we'll start with you, please. <coughs> Thank 
had a chance to rehearse this. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wicked in ten. <clears throat> being kind to him, and he assured me it was. Please, friend. years later they made him a half colonel. <laughs> <laughs> Retired officer, I'm always telling them to never give up. <laughs> <laughs> Strange that uh, Slater retired and uh, 17 years after they thought, well maybe he should be a half colonel. So they, they gave him the rank. Well, I'm going to read a few verses and they're ones that you know, I'll just read them from the New English uh, Bible. Jesus had just heard about the death of John the Baptist. When he heard what had happened, Jesus withdrew privately by boat to a lonely place. 
But people heard of it and came after him in crowds by land from the towns. You've got to picture the scene to get away from the people to have the peace and quiet. He got in a boat and set out on the other side of the lake. But the people who were looking out for him noticed what he was up to, so they ran all the way to the outside of the lake. And when he got there, there they were again, inescapable. When he came ashore, he saw a great crowd. His heart went out to them, and he cured those who were sick. When it grew late, the disciples came up to him and said, This is a lonely place. The day has gone. Send the people off to the villagers to buy themselves <coughs> food. He answered, There's no need for them to go. Give them something to eat yourselves. All we have here, they said, is five loaves and two fishes. Let me have them, <coughs> he replied. So he told the people to sit down on the grass, then taking the five loaves and the two fishes, he looked up to heaven, said the blessing, broke the loaves, and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate to their heart's content. And the scraps left over, which they picked up, were enough to fill twelve great baskets. You know why there were twelve great baskets, don't you? Every blessed disciple had a little bag of his own and they filled it with the crumbs that were left. You <laughs> never ask why the statistician let us know there were two. He didn't say there were lots of baskets. There were. No, no, there were twelve. Uh, careful lot, you know, nothing to be wasted. I learned that in a Salvation Army officer's home. <laughs> nothing is wasted. Gathered up the fragments that remain was something often on my mother's lips. Some 5,000 men, apart from the kids and the wives, some 5,000 men shared in this meal, to say nothing of women and children. <laughs> See how they didn't even count, <laughs> literally, in the statisticians, they only counted the men. It's funny, when we were lieutenants, you only counted the, the people in the meeting who were 12 years or over. <laughs> And if they were under 12, they didn't, they weren't, they weren't, and the Lord didn't worry about them, they didn't count. And it was like that in those days, that uh, when there was a crowd, they counted the men, but they moved on to a lot of them, but they had no significance. No wonder the, the world needed Jesus to put that attitude right, and he's still working in it, I think. <laughs> when, uh, what's his name, the Muslim leader says, it's all right to wash Wop your wife, provided they can't see where you whopped them. I mean, you know, that's a muslin <laughs> scheme of things. I think we need a good saviour to put some of those things right in the world. Now, I've discovered long ago that if I give people a title for what I want to say, I don't forget what I'm talking about, and you will perhaps remember what I'm talking about. Now, the title I give is one that will make you remember it, you see. And that there's an association of ideas. So you think of the, the stupid thing I said, and you remember the more important thing that the book said, that sort of hang on to them. So if they ask when you go home to get your soup and supper or whatever you're having, and they want to John talk about, well, he said, chips with anything, or if you like chips with everything. Now you've got it. Now you've got the message. <laughs> the trouble is, you know, if I'm still alive ten years from now, we meet you sometime and they say, I remember that sermon about chips. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's true that uh, the French people have no respect for British meals. And I've had 47 years of French meals and I'm the better for it, <laughs> I'm told. But, uh, the, the French criticise the British, and you know what they say, with a beautiful accent, of course, which I've given up trying to imitate long ago. The British, they have cheeps. They don't say chips, they say cheeps. They have cheeps with everything. If they have a, a beautiful side of lamb, they have cheeps. And if there's a bit of salmon, they put cheeps. <coughs> they always have that. Well, now, what do I want to hang that on to? 
I want to hang that on to this phrase, which I think is good. For the Christian, for the Christian, and perhaps especially for the Salvationist, with us, it has always been a case of compassion with everything. Salvation Army, since its beginnings, has done all kinds of things. I sometimes think we've specialised in too many programmes. We're clever at this, we're good at that. We do this activity, we have that activity. We're bringing out new programmes, new projects, and some of them I don't even pronounce them properly, and I don't know what it's all about. I'm still trying to think what a love is about, except the love that I knew as a teenage young man in love for the first time. But they, these programmes, they're all new, they're different. But has got something. And you know, I don't, I say this very carefully, and don't misquote me, I, I don't care that there's lots of programs and a variety. I think the Lord is in favour of variety. I'm an ecumenist, and I think it's beautiful that the churches are getting together, but I wouldn't like them to disappear. I think the Lord liked the variety, and each of the churches fulfils a particular task in a particular way, and the Salvation Army is not the same task as the Baptists and the Pentecostalists or the Presbyterians. We, we were made for something, and the variety seems to appeal to him. I don't disagree with variety, but with the Salvation Army, everything we do is with compassion. What is compassion? I tried to give you a, a definition, you could make one probably better yourself. What is compassion? It's the, it's the passion. Uh, I'm going to try and if I can get across it with a gesture. It's the compassion. Concern. The costly concern. The persistent concern for the needs of others be those needs, spiritual or material needs. I don't care what the army does, provided there's compassion with it that's costly, persistent, and response to the spiritual or material needs of other people. It's not an irregular now or then, end and flow kind of thing, Christian compassion, it is a persistent, a regular, a never giving up, never giving in, compassionate concern. Not just a what a pity about him, what a, isn't it a shame about that. No, it's a book, it's a passionate concern for about him. And, and this girl's situation, I'm looking for a, for a solution and I'm looking for it passionately. It, that's the kind of compassion that the Salvationist has with everything. <coughs> Need, you see, is more common than we suppose. Need, of course, if people are in some desperate need, there are exceptions, but mostly when people are in desperate need, they hide it. I know a, a little lady in America, I often think of her when I talk about this kind of subject. She was a South American, and every time she met me, she'd say, Hello, John. How are you? <laughs> Beautiful. I said, Say it again, love. <laughs> <laughs> John, she could play. <laughs> wow, she could, she could do a half an hour on it, you know. John, how are you? I'm fine, I'm fine. And I say, and how are you? And she'd say, I'm fine. I know she was in pain. I knew she was desperately ill. I knew she had problems at home. But she said, I'm fine. And we're all pretty good at that. And when we're, when we're needing help the most, we insist that we're fine. Need is rarely naked, it's disguised, it's camouflaged, it's hidden, there's a pretense comes to play. There are people hurting in the world out there, but most of them are not letting on. 
not letting on. There's a pretended peace where there is no peace. There is a pseudo happiness that is often a facade for a kind of hell. But pretense is very clever. And the compassionate person might say, I don't know what the fuss is about. I'm a compassionate person, but I can't see anybody in need. Well, one of the saints of the past was a man called Commissioner Cooper, and he said to us, and I've never forgotten it, he said, look boys, knock on every street in the neighborhood near your hall, and you'll discover behind every fourth door, there'll be somebody in trouble. The kid's just left home. The baby's got chicken. He's left his job and he doesn't know how to tell his wife. And he's about to leave his wife. And those kids are going to do that. Knock on the doors. Every one in four is trouble. Now, I used to think it was, you know, our commissioners do they exaggerate just a little, you know, they lay it on a bit thick. But after I'd been an officer for a year or two, I think his statistics were wrong. It isn't every fourth door, it's every other door. There are people hurting, and they need a compassionate response. But they don't let on. They're in trouble. And if you think that because we're Christians, we're not in those people who need anything. Who are we kidding? I look often on a new congregation. I hate preaching to a new congregation. I think the core officer has the best of it. To look into your faces, pretty well the same number, a few strangers, it's true, but... So you can say, you know what I said last Sunday? And they all say, yes, I remember chips with everything you see so <laughs> they remember the silly bit. I said, well you remember that, that sermon I preached on Sunday? They said, yeah, yeah. And I'd say, I didn't get it quite right now. What I meant to say, you know, when you're a special, you can't say that. You can't go back the next Sunday and say, look, it wasn't very right. You see, it's better to be a core officer because you can give them the whole story, the balanced thing. It's, it's, it's great. But I do know now, what was my biggest score? Probably, probably with 350 soldiers or William Booth Memorial Halls. But I'll tell you, in the congregation, I know, they don't know. The people sitting next to them. But the pastor who's done his job for a year or two, he knows. You do know, don't you, that the person who knows the core best is an officer who's been here a few years because he gets the confidence of people he knows. I could make you smile at some of the things. People present a front, <coughs> and they're bleeding. And they're crying. People in our college, people in our town, people in our core, people in our family. <sighs> Jesus was for compassion. He was not against it. On the contrary, he was for compassion. And he applauded compassion. And the Good Samaritan in the story that he told says that the man who was beaten up left by the side of the road was in bad shape and the religious blokes came along and they didn't cross over the road so much to look at him. But this one, this Samaritan, he had compassion. And he crossed the road and did it. <coughs> because compassion isn't just a sentiment. Oh, how terrible, how sorry. Now that's only the beginning. The compassionate bit is the bit when you cross over the road and bind up his wounds with oil and wine. The salvationist I'm addressing you all and myself. We are Samaritan people. We are across the road people. We don't only face need <coughs> when it's thrust at us. 
where we can't escape it, we don't only feel compassion when some hurt presents itself. The Salvationist crosses the road when he sees some, somebody hurting. But he goes looking for them. He goes looking for trouble, not dodging it. You know, you could say that the Salvation Army <coughs> came into being because the founder crossed the road. You know the story? He was their Methodist minister, gave them up because they weren't evangelical enough. And they wouldn't let him be the evangelist he wanted to be, so sadly and with great regret, he left the Methodists because he often said that there's only one God and John Wesley is his prophet. He left with tears, but he left the Methodists and uh, he was a freelance evangelist and one Saturday night, I think it was, he was walking down Whitechapel Road near the blind beggar and there was a group of evangelists trying to get the message across and they were having a bad time. <coughs> so what did he do? He had compassion on them. And he crossed over the road. He said, would you like me to have a go? Oh yes, they said, come on. So he got up on the chair and when he spoke, they listened. And he spoke for 20 minutes and the people outside the pub came to listen to him, and when he'd finished, he said, Amen, and came down and said, Oh, you're the Duke and well, we've got a little mission going, and the leader, he's sick, would you like to come and lead our little mission for a week or two? Three weeks, perhaps? Three weeks? Yes, he said, okay, three weeks. And, of course, the three weeks became three months, and it became three years, and the tent, they were holding the mission in, blew down, and they began to have me. And why is there a salvation army? Because William Bowler had come. We are a compassionate people who go looking for trouble. And everything that we do, we do with compassion. We do all kinds of things, don't we? We have Boy Scouts. I think I'm glad you've got some Boy Scouts here. Although I expect here, in most places, you can't get leaders, can you? You can't get leaders. And uh, scouting isn't, you know, I, I was an enthusiast. My father saw to that, I've never lost it. it. I'm a scout. I think it's a great discipline and an education for, for lads. But it has to have compassion. In that scout group, there's uh, two or three lads at a time that are in real trouble. And if you've got the compassion, you'll find the help and answer the knee. And of course the Home League, I believe in Home Leagues, I've got to have been brought up in Home Leagues. And they have to remember you have Home Leagues with compassion. And of course you have the League of Mercy work with compassion. And you have things like Mother and Me, is it? Me and Mother? Mother and Me. Mother and me. Yeah. I think the Mother and Me thing is a fantastic idea if it's done with compassion. Mm. Not just a bit of a club and a bit of a giggle and a, a nice time for the ladies while their kids are romping about on the floor. It's because it's done by the Salvationists, there's compassion in it. A door <coughs> open, an eye wide. Here's somebody that needs a bit more than that. One of the best things we've had since we came to Chatham was to sit in the we had to sit in the, in the gallery that day because there was a, a dedication from a lady from the mother and me. Do you remember? She mm -hmm. was bringing the baby. And Malcolm, you know, you've had an expert here on how to do the thing right. And, you know, there were about 30 members of the family in the gallery who absolutely you could tell by their wide eyes they, they didn't know anything much about the army. And then he brought the, the, the father and mother and the godfather and godmother and the other child and the new child onto the platform and they were looking around. And I thought, now, somebody who, you can perhaps tell me, but somebody knew that you've got to do mother and me with compassion. Mm -hmm. And Malcolm did his part 
going to visit them and saying, OK, you want to dedicate this baby, but you know what it means, don't you? You've got to bring him up a Christian. That's what it means. You've got fathers. You're not just here to stand on the platform. You ought to see that they learned to be followers of Jesus. And that family is not far from the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. Because it was mother and me with compassion and responding always. Of course, the Beatles sang it in a way, didn't they, when they sang what the world needs now is love. Yes, love. It still does. It did before the Beatles were born. And before the Beatles were born, the Salvationists were singing the same song in a rather more dignified way. <laughs> <laughs> the Salvationists were singing, unless I am moved with compassion. How dwelleth thy spirit in word and in deed, burning love is my need. And people say to me, because I'm getting old now, you know, they like to say to the old boys, what do you think of the present army? Is there any hope for it, you know? <laughs> for the prophets of, of the wet blanket, are they? <laughs> God bless them, if you can. Uh, uh, there's a lot of people on next day. Is there any hope for it? Is there? And I say, the army could be wonderful. It's not bad as it is. It's better than we think. We're always running it down. It's not bad as it is. But if the Salvationist would remember to do everything with compassion, feel personally, passionately concerned for the spiritual welfare of the material needs of another person. When we do that, we do what the Salvationist was created to do, and the Lord can't help to bless it. And if you want church growth, then you have to have compassion with everything. And I'm glad to say, and I give you full marks, I've been here long enough to take the temperature. This core has a lot of compassion. And if you're having some success, and they tell you the core's a bit bigger and a bit better than it used to be a few years ago, it's not because you're better organized or you've had brilliant officers or that you get very well educated here and cultivated and gifted. It's none of that. What is winning the growth is the compassion. The compassion. So you feel when you come into this fellowship that there's compassion. It's not a snoopy or a curious compassion. It's an offer of genuine interest and concern, which I personally felt since I've been here. And the new people know it. You can't fake it. You can't have a bad shoe you know, and shake my hands and say, I'm compassionate. What can I do to help you? Oh my goodness, you know. They won't come back again, will they? You know, it's no good. But the, the genuine thing, they feel it, they know, and they're drawn. Everything with compassion. Christ did everything with compassion. Compassion is costly. <coughs> compassion is necessary. And compassionate needs to be imaginative. Compassion uses its imagination, finds a way there's a lot of imagination among the compassionate people. When I came back to England after 20 years, I was 20 years away, you know, I almost forgot the language. Well, they don't speak in America or in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> they certainly don't in France, let me tell you. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's uh, things you notice when you, when you come, come back. And one of the way, things I've noticed is that there's a lot of imagination among the compassionates. For example, there's a, there's a, there's a call that puts a little notice in, you know those newspapers they put through the door, and you, and you don't even read it, you don't, but people do read it. 
and they put in a little panel like this. Have you got a subject that you would like us to bring to God in prayer? Phone so-and-so. And every week there's at least half a dozen. I've just lost my mother. Will you pray for me? We of the Salvation Army will pray for you. That's the imagination, isn't it? It doesn't cost much. And what about the, the bereaved? I know a Salvationist in Liverpool. She's done it for years. She does it still. She literally gets the local paper <coughs> and she, she looks up the births, deaths and marriages and she chooses one from each category like this. And she pulls them out and says, I'll write to that one, that one, and that one. And I'm going to write to that one because there's been a bereavement, and that one because they've had a baby in the family, and this because they just came back. My dear friend, we of the Salvation Army hear that you must have loved one. We want to assure you of our prayer. Our meeting on Sunday morning is every Sunday at such a time. If you want to come, you'll hear your prayer, because this Sunday we're going to pray for you. It's a compassion. The offer of a blessing. <clears throat> Putting in the newspaper. You want your baby to be blessed. You don't belong to church. Well, we'll bless them. Bring them. You know? mm. Of course, there's ten weeks go and nothing happens. And then on the eleventh week, the phone goes. I've got a baby. We haven't had it named. Could you do it for us? Compassion. Genuine. You can't fake it. You can't fake it. And I discovered in, in England there are three clubs. I expect there's more now. There was three clubs when we came back from Australia. And they're the clubs for the twins and triplets parents. Parents of twins or triplets. <coughs> it's wording, actually. Wording. They have a twins and tri triplets club. Are you looking at me as if, does, do this, does a family that has twins or twins or triplets, do they need compassion? Well, they really well do. <laughs> we only had that one at a time. But getting up half the night with one, when you've got two or three, you need a bit of sympathy. <laughs> <laughs> and you say, when well, nobody comes, do they? Oh, they do. They do. They bring the kids. Somebody plays with the kids in the YB hall while the others share the latest trouble they've had. And they always conclude with a little word of prayer. The compassion is handed. All right, chips with everything. What has it got to do with banding? Banding with compassion is essential. Use your imagination, ladies and gentlemen, please. But whatever you do, don't forget to add the compassion. I'm speaking now to the experienced ones, and it doesn't need me to tell you that every opportunity like going to the cathedral to play soon. If you keep your eyes open, there's an ex-salvationist there, and if you're listening to the spirit, you'll just show a little interest. Don't <coughs> kill him, don't squash him, don't push him. Just say, well, but how nice to see you. Come over to our house. Don't say come to the homeless meeting, that won't do. Come to our house, and we'll have fish and chips supper like the others. Come on. <coughs> Well, there you are, it's chips and everything, isn't it? <laughs> Even a bit of evangelism. Now, use your imagination, your gift of creativity, and if you ask the Spirit to lead you, you'll find where the people who need your compassionate, passionate concern, you'll find them, or the Spirit will lead you. Now, Chris is going to finish all this, please, Chris. With your song. <coughs> and then I want somebody to pray. Have compassion and pray for John and Giselle Gowans because we're going on a holiday and we won't have the support of Chatham Sunday morning and evening meeting. For seven weeks in succession now, how I'm going to hold up, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but one of us is going to pray for us, please. We often pray for you. Let's listen to the song. <laughs>
in our band practice tonight in a very special way and we thank you for the privilege that we've had this evening of listening to your message to us from our friend John Gowns we thank you for what he does as a member of this core family <coughs> along with Giselle for the compassion that he brings for the ability that he brings to communicate to people, both individually and in a group like this. And we really thank you, Lord, that we're privileged to have the family here. Lord, you will see tonight many years of banding in this core represented here. And we want to thank you for that as well, for the faithfulness that you show to us and the faithfulness of salvationists in serving you through the ministry of music. I know there's been many times when the music the band have played has been just what I need. <coughs> and I'm sure that that experience is repeated right around this room. And not just within the Salvation Army, Lord, we, we're convinced that there is a reason for having a band. There is a reason for the music that we play being written and that we should take the opportunities that are given to us to witness to people but not just to witness Lord to be compassionate as we've heard this evening everything we do as Chatham Court needs to be done in a caring way and we look for your guidance in that so the words we say and the songs that are sung they're just right. Mm. Father, the many sacrifices are made to allow this band to operate. Not just from the people who are in the band, but from the families who are represented here. And we pray, Lord, that while we are being blessed by being part of this band, our families will be blessed by you, mm. because we couldn't do it without them. And we pray as this band continues to operate and as we move on from spiritual high to the next spiritual high that you will continue to be faithful to us so that when we're in the lower parts between each high point you will still be there and we will be able to get through. Father once again thank you for tonight. Thank you for blessing me. Thank you for blessing the people here and be with us as we continue to try and be Christian and try and live our lives in the compassionate way that you want us to. Amen. Amen. May the blessing of God, Almighty, Father, Son, Holy Spirit.
rest upon this call all associated with it, right now and always. Amen. And amen. 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 Thank you for the privilege. Thank you.